Hi, this is Tammy McClish. Let's take a look at Section 7, Digital Imaging. The definition of digital imaging is any imaging acquisition process that produces an electronic image that can be viewed and manipulated on a computer. The first image you see with the girl putting a plate into a processing system, that is called CR. Now in a little bit, we're going to talk about another term related to CR. But right now, I want you to think about computerized radiography. Whenever somebody walks around with a cassette and they put it into a machine and the machine sucks a plate out and then it goes to the computer. The other type of digital imaging I want you to think about is something that's called DR. DR is digital radiography. That's where a patient puts their hand down on a plate. You take the x-ray and the image appears on your computer monitor. So those are both digital imaging aspects. So to understand digital, you first need to understand analog. Analog refers to a device or system that captures or measures a continuously changing signal. So in the first picture, you see a clock. And on the clock, there is a second hand that is continuously changing. So analog is a device or system that captures or measures a continuously changing signal. If we are going to digital, we have to begin with an analog signal. Now, I was asking my kids about the Sony PlayStation controller, and I wanted to know what the analog button on that meant. I didn't quite understand. And they said that when you hit the analog button, you go back to the old day, like when I used to play Pac-Man, and you could actually move Pac-Man from side to side, up or down. Well, I had to think about Pac-Man. They were telling me about something else, but Analog there means that you use the, I call them the joystick controllers that moves whatever's on your screen side to side, up or down. So it is something that continuously shows a changing signal. Here's an analog sine wave. And the definition is recorded or used in its original form. So in this picture, we have a source, which is a gentleman playing a trumpet. His sound goes through the air, and it is picked up on a tape, which is an old cassette that we used to use. The only way for somebody else to hear that sound would be for them to put it into a system that's going to play it so that the sound goes through the speakers and someone else can hear that sound. That's an analog signal. It has to be captured and then replayed. Here is an analog image. An analog image is placed on a piece of radiographic film. Now, back in the day when we were using x-ray film, in fact, I can tell that this is x-ray film because down at the bottom, you can see that it's a little brown, and that's because there's still a little bit of fixer that's retained on that image. Plus, this is a really old image because back in the day, even before I was an x-ray tech, I was an x-ray tech in 1985. You see how that the edges of this film is rounded? Well, we didn't have that when I was in school and I started school in 1983. So I can tell you that's probably an image that's from the 1970s. That's a pretty old image. So an analog image is an image that's on a piece of film. Well, here was the problem that we had when we were using film. As you can see, um, there's no name on this film. Well, I definitely wouldn't place a name on here because I wouldn't want you to know the person's name. But when this would happen to me if I was an x-ray technologist, I would have to take a black Sharpie marker and I would have to write the name of the person on that, on that image because that's all I had. I didn't have anything other than a black Sharpie marker. We didn't even have red Sharpie markers back then. So I would try to find a place that it wouldn't interfere with the pathology, but I would have to put it where I had some grayscale and I would put the person's name on there. And as you can see, there is also no place for a date. So we would have to write a date on there. So that's what was wrong with an analog image is that once you took the x-ray, you were kind of sort of stuck. And I have to tell you what we used to do. We were bad. We were sometimes bad. Well. Okay, my friends, no, no some, sometimes I did this, but very rare. 
So as you can see, there is a there is a right marker on this image, and that right marker has the number of the person who took the x-ray. It's probably a very large institution because that's a very high number. So it was a right side of the patient and then the, the number of the person that took the x-ray. Well, sometimes we would go up on portable x-rays and we would forget to do that. So you know what we used to do? Well, my friends, I didn't do it. Well, maybe I did it once. What we would do is we would take this cassette down into the department and we would take and we would put a lead apron over the image. And then what we would do is we would put our right marker down and we would take the portable x-ray machine and we would collimate down really, really small and we would take like a finger x-ray. We would use that little radiation to put that right marker on there. Nobody ever figured it out, but that's sometimes what we would do. That was the only way we could change an analog image was by, um, was by taking a Sharpie marker and writing on it or doing something else. The other thing we used to do, and this is horrible. I did this one time, I have to confess. Um, I took an x-ray up in the ICU. I took a couple of them. And the doctor said, that is too light to darken it up. And by then the patient had been moved so what we did, and I can't believe I'm saying this, we took it in the dark room and we, um, we copied it on the dark room copier and we made it darker and the doctor said the image was okay. So yeah, that was the only way that we could change an analog image. Um, we could also do this. I can't believe I'm telling you all my secrets. Um, if I had the wrong marker on there, like let's say that this was actually the left side, we could actually take scissors and we could just trim that and just say that it got caught in something and no one would know the difference. So yeah, back in the time of analog, there wasn't really anything we could do with the image. The image was the image. We could really couldn't change it. But sometimes analog images would be lost and we couldn't find them. And that was the problem with analog. If you lost this x-ray, you lost the image. So let's take a look at units of measurements. And the reason we have to do this is so that you can understand digital. So there's something that is called the SI system, which is the International System of Units, also known as the metric system. In the decimal system, it is called a base 10 system. Every place is 10 times the one location the 10 location, the hundred, the thousands, et cetera. You have the ones place, the tens place, the hundreds place, the thousands place. Those are placeholders. Computers do not use the digits on the decimal sister system for counting and arithmetic. The computer cannot add the way that we add. The computer central processing unit and memory are made up of millions of tiny switches and these switches are either on or off. They're either up or down. All computer languages translate what the user inputs into a zero, series of ones and zeros that the computer can understand. So you and I can understand the metric system. You and I can understand the decimal system, but computers cannot understand these systems. They use something that's called the binary system. So when a computer is counting, the computer is looking at a series of strings of zeros and ones. And all of these strings placed together give you images on your computer, give you typing on a keyboard. So in order for me to type this word counting, the computer had to take a string of numbers in order to give the word counting on this particular image. Okay, so that's how a computer knows what to do on a computer screen. It has to use zeros and ones. Binary code, the definition is the computer takes data from the user and process it using a medical, excuse me, a machine language of ones and zeros. 
the computer processing is performed by a series of trans transistors, which are switches that are on or off. So let's take a look at this one picture here. When you are looking at any type of electrical device, you will sometimes see that when the switch is moved to the one side, it's off. And when the switch is moved to the other side, it's on. What that does is it either stops the connection or completes the connection. It's kind of like flipping a wall switch. You, swip, you flip the wall switch on and it completes the circuit or you turn it off and it stops the circuit. If the transistor circuit is closed and current passes through, it is assigned a value of one. If no current passes because the circuit is open, it is assigned a value of zero. So anytime you have a zero or a one, it is called a bit, B-I-T, bit. So the binary number system is called the base two system. You only have two digits, zeros and ones. Every place is going to be represented by two times the placeholder. So here is the placeholder for one, here is the placeholder for two, and so on. So those are just placeholders, okay? Each place in the number represents two times the number to the right. So, one times one is two, two times two is four, four times four is eight, and so on, okay? So that's the binary conversion. That's how we determine the binary conversion, is we're taking the original number in the placeholder and we're multiplying it by itself to give the next part in the placeholder. The binary numbering system uses a series of zeros and ones to represent any number. Non-numbers are letters, such as the letter K, or characters such as the space bar are assigned an eight digit binary number so they too can be represented within the computer. When data is input into a computer, the input is converted into a system of binary numbers, zeros and ones. The computer stores these binary numbers through the presence or absence of an electrical charge. Zeros and ones represent on and off switches in the computer. So if I wanted to sit at my computer and hit the space bar. When I hit the space bar, the computer populates into, well, the keyboard populates into the computer this code. And that code tells my computer to act as a space bar. If I wanted an explanation point, this is what comes out of my computer for it to appear on my computer screen. So that's how binary code works. So I talked about it a little bit ago. I talked about the word bit, okay? So now we're gonna talk about bit. A bit is a binary digit. It is a single unit of data. It is the smallest amount of information a computer can hold. A single bit specifies a single value of zero or one. Now, if you take a bunch of bits and you put them next to each other, you end up with something that is called a byte. A byte, the basic unit of measure of computer's memory, a byte usually has eight bits. And if you have a byte, you call it a character, which is eight separate binary digits. So for example, if I looked through this particular set of digits and I found this sequence, that would be the lowercase letter D. So if somebody is working with computers, they have to know 
how to determine the bits and bytes in a computer. Now, when we're working with X-ray, we're working with bits. It's the number, the number of the states represents the possibility with n bits. So if I have one bit of data, I have two states of either, um, two states of gray. I have two states of shades of gray. Now, believe it or not, a shade of gray is actually white or black. That's a shade of gray. I know it makes no sense, but it is. Anytime we have a shade of gray, it's a level of information. And those level of information lead to an image on our computers. So think about it this way. We can take an x-ray and only have two bits of information, black and white. Or we can take an x-ray that has 10 bits of information, which has 1,024 shades of gray. You're going to have more information with more shades of gray. So the power of two notation is used in radiology to describe image size, image dynamic range or shades of gray, and image storage capacity. This is a one bit system. We only have two shades of gray, white or black. Two bit system is four shades of gray. Three bit, eight shades of gray. Four bit, 16 shades of gray. This is more like an abdomen x-ray. There's more shades of gray. Where if I was going to take a hand x-ray, there would be less shades of gray. It's gonna be more black and white. And then an eight bit system is 256 shades of gray. You can see more pathology if you have more shades of gray. And this will definitely show you what I'm talking about with shades of gray. So in 1970, we had our first CAT scan. It was only an eight bit system, which showed 256, 256 shades of gray. That's an ugly picture. That's what CAT scans looked like back in 1970. That is the only amount of information that we could see. And the reason we picked 256 shades of gray was because that's what the radiologists felt comfortable visualizing when they were looking at an image. The picture to the right, in 2000, we are looking at 20-bit systems, and there are so many shades of gray. And this is actually an MRI. You can see everything that is going on in this individual. You can see the tumor, you can see the ventricles, you can see so much in this image. That's why we needed to have more shades of gray. Now, when you go to purchase a digital imaging system, you can pick how many shades of gray you want to see. If you have an eight to 10 bit system, you're about 256 to 1024 shades of gray. A 12 to 14 bit system is more shades of gray. Shades of gray give you more potential. So if you are doing podiatric x-rays, you probably don't need as many shades of gray because it's just bone, bone and soft tissue. But if you're gonna be doing like maybe chest x-rays or abdomen x-rays, you're gonna need more shades of gray because you're gonna to have to see all the different detail with all the different organs in the body systems. When the bits are increased, the information on the screen is increased. Now here's the difference. Our eye can only detect about, our eye works as a five to 18 bit system. So that's how much information we can see when we are looking on our eye. Our eye can see 40 to 256 shades of gray, which is around a five to eight bit system. The picture on top is a 40 shade image, which is a five bit system. 
and the picture on the bottom is 18-bit system, 256 shades. So as you can see, you lose a lot of pixeling when you're seeing more shades of gray. So if my eye can only detect 40 to 256 shades of gray, why would I go buy something that gives me 16,000 shades of gray? Well, what we can do is we can take our computer, remember it's a computer generated image, and we could take a look at certain points on the image to look for pathology. And that's why we have so many shades for digital imaging because we can hone in on an area and we can look at that compared to the entire image. So let's take a look at these terms that you probably use but don't understand. So a bit is only one bit of data. A byte is eight bits of data. A kilobyte is 1,024 bytes of data. And as we move up, we have more and more bytes of data. Now, when would we use these terms? Well, if I took my computer keyboard and if I wanted to type the word the, T-H-E, that would represent three characters. Now, if I wanted to store that in a Word document, that would be 19.5 kilobytes of data, okay? So that's 19.5 kilobytes of data. If I wanted to take my computer and use a Word document and type an entire page of data, that would be 22 kilobytes of data, but that would be 1,414 characters. If I wanted to um, game, my children like to game. I don't like to game. I don't know how to game. But I would want to go ahead and buy a system that could hold a terabyte or a petabyte. My son just purchased a VR system, and that has a petabyte of data. So people do use that much data. One image on a chest x-ray is about 8 to 32 megabytes of data. That's how much it, you need in order to store data. Now, if you are burning disks for patients to take with them, make sure that it is a single write only. You cannot use a rewritable disk in order to store data because that is a HIPAA violation. Now, at the hospital, we don't use um, CDs. We use DVDs because we're burning multiple images for patients. We're burning um, ultrasounds, CAT scans. We're burning lots and lots of x-rays. So if you are just burning x-rays, then you could probably get away with CDs that are single write only. But if you are going to burn multiple images, CAT scans, things like that, you're going to have to have DVDs that are single write only. So we talked about analog, we talked about digital, let's bring them together. There's something inside a digital system that is called an ADC, an analog to digital conversion system. It accepts a continuously varying signal the analog signal and it digitizes it. So in order for information sent to the computer to be processed, we first need to digitize the signal. A numerical value is assigned to each light photon. The emitted light is converted from the storage phosphor into an electrical signal. The electrical signal is sampled and digitized to represent a specific location within the image matrix and displays a specific brightness. A matrix is a group of squares that make up the image information. So in the top picture, I have for you an analog system. And when that analog signal goes across, when we digitize it, we're going to amplify it and take it so that there's no dipping there's no loss in the data, okay? So that's why 
in the first box, you can see that we only have a positive pulse. And it's because we had, an, we had a signal coming in and we needed to make it one uniform value. Okay, remember, anytime there's one, there's something there. When there's a zero, there's nothing there. That's why a digital signal, I'm gonna say amplifies it, I'm probably saying the wrong term, but it makes it more consistent. So consistent image, consistent signal, no signal. Consistent signal, no signal. Think about it this way. If you're as old as I am, then you probably remember a modem. Well, we all have modems if we have, um, if we have, um, oh, what is it? My brain stopped for a second. If we have a uh, spectrum or we had cable, if we have cable coming in, we have a modem that we can't see. But back in the day, I had a telephone line and I used to transcribe. I was a transcriptionist for my doctor's office. So I would go ahead and I would type, 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 and I would then have to send through my telephone line, through my modem, I had to send the images to the office. So those images went from my computer, which was digitized, it went to my modem, it went through my telephone, it went to their modem, it was picked up, and it received over in the office, and it actually printed in the office, which was kind of cool, because then I was able to work all night, and then when I went in in the morning, all my work was done. Okay, that's what we used to have. It's no different than what I showed you earlier, where that somebody is singing into a microphone, it goes into a system that digitizes it, and then it can be listened to later. So we can take it from analog to digital analog. Now this picture on the bottom shows you this side over here is the digital image and this is the analog image. The analog image is grainy. It has to be run through an analog to digital converter. And that's what happens in our processing of our images. It goes through an analog to digital conversion. Pixels. Pixels are picture elements. It is the cell of a digital image matrix. Each pixel contains pieces or bits of information. The smaller the pixel, the greater the detail. Now, when I look at this, I look at a light bright set. Remember the light bright set we used to have where that you took little pegs and you put them in holes and where you put the colored pegs, you saw a picture, same thing. The pixel size can change when the size of the matrix or field of view changes. So let's say that we're x-raying an entire hand and then we go down to just a digit. We change the field of view. I'm looking at just the index finger instead of the entire hand. That is going to change our matrix because we've gone from the entire hand just down to the index finger. There's something called a pixel bit depth the number of bits within a pixel. If a pixel has a bit depth of eight, then the number of gray tones the pixel can produce is two to the power of the bit system. And we talked about this before. So two to the fifth is 256 shades of gray. Most digital imaging systems have bit depths of 10 to 16, resulting in more shades of gray. So the first picture you're seeing in the middle is an 8-bit system, which means you can see 256, in this case, colors, instead of shades of gray, colors. Where the one to the right is showing you a 24-bit system, which gives you more colors that you can see. So that's how televisions run, the same way as x-ray. A matrix is rows and columns of pixels displayed on a digital image. Each box within the matrix also represents to a specific location in the image and corresponds to a specific area on the patient's tissue. The image is digitized both by position 
which is its spatial location, and its intensity, which is its gray level. The matrix size determines the size of the pixels. So if I have a 10 by 12, all right, let's go back here for a second. Let's go back here for a second. So think about when you were buying pictures when you were a kid, you were buying pictures for when you were in school and you always wanted your parent to buy the 10 by 12 to hang in your living room and they bought a five by seven. And you're like, well, that's not very big. The 10 by 12 is going to show you a larger field of view. It's the same picture, but you can see more. So if I was going to x-ray a hand, and if I had the ability to do so, I would grab a cassette that was the size of an 8 by 10. I wouldn't put it on a 14 by 17 because I'd be wasting a lot of the matrix. I'd be wasting a lot of the pixels. So think of it that way, okay, when we're thinking about this. So let me go back here. So the matrix size determines the size of the pixels. So if you have a 10 by 12 and a 14 by 17 plate, and both have a 512 by 512 matrix, then the x-ray you shot on the 10 to 12 cassette will have smaller pixels. The larger the matrix, the larger the film size of the image. So when we're looking off to the very right hand side here, we see the original picture. If we take that picture and we change the matrix, it's going to become pixelated. It's like an avatar, I'm probably saying that wrong. There's this I don't even know what it is. Um, my neighbor one year um, went and had a cartoon of a picture of a face mask and it looked like the 32 by 32. I didn't get that, but I guess that there is a character out there that likes to be pixelated. I don't know the name of the character and my children aren't here in the room with me to ask, but if you want to see all the pixels, then the matrix size changes. Okay, we don't want to see pixels when we're taking x-rays. We want to see pretty pictures. Spatial resolution or spatial frequency resolution is the ability to image small objects that have high subject contrast. The detail of the image is measured in line pairs per millimeter. Spatial resolution is going to equal the field of view divided by the matrix. So we kind of sort of talked about that. Am I going to x-ray the entire hand or am I going to x-ray just the digit? And then am I going to pick a 14 by 17 or a 10 by 12? So your resolution is going to change depending upon the system that you use. Back in the day when I was in x-ray school, we used film screen radiography. The sharpness was controlled by the focal spot. And the focal spot was on my computer console. I would either choose small or large. It also was controlled by the screen that I chose and the film speed. So if I was gonna x-ray hand, I would grab an extremity cassette. If I was gonna x-ray a head, I would grab a 400 speed system. And it's also going to change in film screen and radiography by the object to image distance, which meant that I would put the hand right on the cassette. I wouldn't take it and hover it over the cassette. So that's how I was able to control my resolution when I had film. Focal spot and object to image distance affect image sharpness in film screen radiography and digital. So right now, the way that you control in a digital image your sharpness is by your focal spot and your object to image distance. Digitized image can also be controlled for sharpness by adjusting processing parameters such as edge enhancement. And that is all happening between your radiologist 
and the person that put in your system or by your doctor and the person that puts in your system. So spatial resolution allows me to look past this pneumonia on this chest X-ray on the right to see what's going on behind that pneumonia. You need spatial resolution with your system. So what happens to the images after we take them? Well, we used to have a film file room. So we would take all of our x-rays, our film screen radiographs, and we would have the doctor read the x-rays and then we would put them in a film file room and we would hope that we didn't mislabel them and we hope we didn't spill coffee on them and we would put them in a film file room. With digital imaging, we have something that is called DICOM. DICOM is the Digital Imaging and Communication in Medicine Standard. It's a standard that enables imaging systems from different manufacturers to communicate. So in my hospital, we have Agfa. We also have Toshiba. We also have CareStream. We have all these different systems. If we didn't have DICOM, they can't talk to each other. So it was developed by the American College of Radiology and the National Electrical Manufacturers Association. DICOM is not a file format, so it's not like a JPEG or a PDF, but it's a series of standards that describes a file format. And it's because when my radiologist is sitting in the reading room, he's going to have images coming in from the Toshiba CT scanner. He's going to have images coming off the portable that are care stream, and he's got to be able to read them all. He can't go and flip switches between images. They all have to come in in the same parameters so he can read them. So in the hospital, in bigger systems, we have something that is called PACS. PACS is Picture Archiving Communication Systems. Now, before I talk about it, let me talk about this. So if you have a small doctor's office, you do not have to have PACs. Your images can stay on your control console and your doctor can read them and then you're done. You will need PACs if the images are going to go out to be stored or they're going to be go to a server where they go on to a radiologist or on to other physicians to look at, okay? So PACS is Picture Archiving Communication System. It allows the acquisition, interpretation, and storage of each medical image in digital form without rest restoring to film, which is the hard copy. PACS serves as the file room, the reading room, the duplicator, and the courier. Now, if you buy a digital system, you usually have to buy a PACS, which is an additional cost. You don't have to have a PAX. If you're going to keep everything in house, then you might not to have a have a PAX. So smaller doctors' offices may not have to purchase a PAX, but most people do purchase a PAX because it's kind of like, well, if I'm going to spend all this money, I might as well just go ahead and do everything. So that's a PAX. All right. So let's take a look at the meat and potatoes here. So. I talked to you earlier about something that was called CR. CR is computerized radiography. Well, there's also another term that we now need to know, and that is photostimulable phosphor image capture. So anytime you see CR, you need to substitute it or equate it in your head to PSP. They are the same thing. Some textbooks say CR, some textbooks say PSP but it is the digital acquisition modality that uses storage phosphor plates to produce projection images. And this is the system we used to have at our hospital. This is an AGFA system. So earlier we talked about computerized radiography or CR. CR is also known as photostimulable phosphor or a PSP image capture. So anytime you think of CR, it is the same as PSP. 
The digital acquisition modality that uses storage phosphor plates to produce projection images. Now, when we used to take film screen radiography, we called that a cassette. This here is a PSP cassette, and we also call that an imaging plate or an IP. It is made of lightweight plastic material. The IP is backed by a thin sheet of aluminum or lead that absorbs backscatter X-ray photons. The IP also contains an anti-static material. Usually it's felt to protect against static electricity buildup, dust collection, and mechanical damage to the IP. When we're looking at this particular cassette, the orange part that we're seeing, that is the back of the cassette. The black part is going to be the front of the cassette where the patient stands or the patient um, puts their hand or whatever they're going to do. And the way that this functions is we write on this cassette when we're imaging patients. So let's say that I'm in the ICU and I'm in ICU bed nine. I'm gonna write that with a marker on the front of my cassette. And then when I go to process it, I just go ahead and erase it. So we write on our cassettes. I'll also write on my cassette that I x-rayed the hand and it was the right hand on the patient. So it's really important with these cassettes that you write on them with not a Sharpie, but an erasable marker. Now this was always interesting to me. I thought this was the coolest thing ever when we received CR. We received CR in our hospital. Oh my goodness gracious, how long ago was that? I would have to say that that was probably maybe 2000, I can't remember. But we had film screen radiography for quite a while. Now let's take a look at these different cassettes. This cassette right here that I have the number one over, that is a extremity cassette. I know it's an extremity cassette because it has a gray border. I also know that it has, it's an extremity cassette because it says that it's a Kodak latex regular screen. So that's telling me that I'm gonna grab that when I'm going to x-ray a hand or a foot. Anything that's extremities, arms and legs. That's also telling me that that is a 100 speed system. Cassette number two is a higher speed system. It is a 400 speed system. So I know that if I'm gonna x-ray a skull, a spine, I'm gonna grab that cassette. If I messed up and I was shooting film, then my film would be either too light or too dark. So we had to be very careful which cassette we grabbed. So then my hospital says, here's your cassette, have at it. And I said, oh, well now what? I have one cassette. Well, here's what we have to do. We have to tell the machine the speed of the cassette. PSP screens do not have the wide, do not have the speed latitudes, excuse me, PSP screens do not have the speed limitations found in film screen systems and it can be used over a wide latitude of exposure ranges. So what I had to do was I had to say, I'm going to take a hand x-ray. And then I walked up to the machine and I typed in the word hand and it suddenly made it a 100 speed cassette. If I was going to x-ray a pelvis, then I would go in and I would type in the word pelvis and boom, this cassette was now a 400 speed system. So that's how we did it with going from film screen to CR or PSPs. If the relative speed of a 200 speed system is a film screen system, then the PSP system can cover from 20 all the way to 2000. But what you have to do is you have to tell it what you want it to be. You say, oh, right now you're a 100 speed cassette, boom, you're a 100 speed cassette. Oh no, now I need you a 400 speed cassette, boom, you're a 400 speed cassette. Okay, so that's how that works with CR or PSP. I'm gonna call it CR or PSP.
In PSP systems, the radiographic image is recorded on a thin piece of plastic known as the imaging plate. There are different layers here to this imaging plate. There's a protective layer, which is a clear plastic, a phosphor layer, which is the active layer. It is a layer of photostimulable phosphors that traps electrons during exposure made up of barium fluoral halide family. The crystals store the latent image until release when re-stimulated during processing. There's a reflective layer, which is a layer that sends light in a forward direction when released in the reader. There is a conductive layer, which is a layer of material that absorbs and reduces static electricities. A color layer, which is on newer plates only, that may contain this layer which absorbs the stimulating light but reflects emitted light. The support layer is polyester, which is a semi-rigid material that gives the imaging sheet some strength, and a backing layer, which is a soft polymer that protects the back of the cassette. So what I have to do in some systems, not all, but some systems require the cassette to be barcoded. It allows the operator to match the image information with the patient identifying barcode on the examination request. The patient identifying barcode and the bar label on the cassette must be scanned and connected to the patient or examination menu. So what I would do is I would scan the cassette and I would identify it to that patient. That's with some systems. Now, the other thing I need to do is I need to orientate my cassette. I need to make sure that I am positioning my cassette in such a way that I don't have to continue to manipulate my image. So if I correctly orientate my cassette, I have less image manipulation that is required in post-processing. If the cassette is orientated correctly, the image will display correctly. Similar to the intensifying screens found in film screen imaging system, storage phosphors can store a portion of the incident x-rays energy in traps within the material for later readout. Now, some systems do not have barcode labels. Um, this is the one that we had at our hospital. This is an identification terminal, which is an IDT. Um, what you would do is you would place your cassette into the IDT. And when you did that, when you placed your, when you placed your cassette down into this IDT reader, it would put the patient's name. You had to hit the F2 button on your control monitor and it would put the patient's information onto that cassette so that we could then put it in the processor for reading. So that was just some systems work that way. Now let's talk about the latent image. Let's go back to film for a second. So in film, the latent image is after I shoot an x-ray on a film screen system, I have an individual individual invisible image that is sitting there until I put it through the processor. So it's latent, and then after I process it, it's manifest. So here in CR or PSP, the latent image, when exposed to radiation, the radiation interacts with the electrons in the barium fluoro halide crystals contained within the imaging plate. This interaction stimulates or gives energy to electrons in the crystals, trapping them in an area of the crystal known as the color or phosphor center. This trap signal will remain for hours, even days, although deterioration begins almost immediately. The imaging plate can never be completely erased. The residual trapped electrons are so few, they do not interfere with subsequent exposures. So in PSP systems, a PSP plate is placed into a cassette. Most PSP plates are made of barium fluoro halide with europium as an activator. The PSP plates can endure hundreds of transfers into the reading device. When the IR is placed into the reader, the imaging plate is removed and fitted to a precision drive mechanism.
In the reader, when X-rays strike the PSP, some light is given off, but some of the photon energy is deposited within the phosphor particles to create the latent image. The PSP plate is fed through the PSP reader to release the latent image, focus laser light to scan over the plate, causing the electrons to return to their original state and emitting light in the process. This light is picked up by a photomultiplier tube or CCD array and converted into an electron signal. The electron signal is then sent through the ADC, which is the um, alternating to digital conversion to produce a digital image that can be sent to the review station. Digital codes are then stored as a series of binary numbers. Once the information is stored in the computer in its digital format, it can be manipulated or enhanced. After enhancement, the new digitized image is stored as a DICON formatted image and sent to PACS. PSP systems can process one image in a minute to 20 seconds. Now, the image to the right is a multi-reader, which was great because you could put up to four plates there. However, each plate takes a minute and 20 seconds. So what I like to do is I would go ahead and take my first x-ray, I would pop it inside the reader, and then while it was in the reader, I'm taking another x-ray. I would go and pop my cassette there. I would take another x-ray and pop my cassette there. By then, this one is done and I can use this one again. So if I went ahead and used all four spaces in this reader, by the time I got to the fourth space, this top one was done and I can go ahead and grab it and use it again. Now, with the CR system or the PSP system, you could have image degrading. So let me talk to you about this for a second. So let's say that you were working at the office and there was a big thunderstorm outside and you went ahead and you were taking a patient's x-ray and before you put it into the reader, the power went out. And you were waiting because you could not process these images. The pattern of stored energy intensities on an imaging replay is the latent image. The stored image will degrade 25% within the first eight hours. So if you went back the next day and the power was on and you went to process this image, 25% of the image would be missing or lessened. So within eight hours, you lose 25% of your image, which is no big deal unless you have a power outage. Now let's say that I'm working in the ICU and I leave at six o'clock in the morning to x-ray patients and by the time that I x-ray 10 patients and I come back I haven't processed any yet. Well within an hour I'm okay. The images will be fine but it's after eight hours you start to lose the image. Now with CR or PSP, you have to erase your cassettes between each patient. It does it for you. The process of reading the image returns most but not all the electrons to a lower energy state, removing the imaging from the plate. Imaging plates are sensitive to scatter radiation and should be erased. So every night, midnight shift, at the end of their shift in the early morning, they take all these cassettes that have been sitting all night and they erase them every morning and they have to log that. And you have to do that if you have CR or PSP. When you walk in in the morning, you have to erase every single one of your cassettes and you have to log that you did that. And that's because they've been sitting around and they could pick up backscatter radiation from the environment. So PSP readers have an erase mode that floods the plate with a light to remove all electrons that are still trapped after the initial, the initial plate reading. Imaging plates are very sensitive to background radiation and scatter radiation and should be erased before use of stored for more than 72 hours. So definitely after a long holiday weekend, you have to erase these cassettes when you come in on Monday morning. 
Now, when I was um, performing mammography, we would do some imaging with the cassettes where we would take like 20 exposures on them and then we would erase them. Sometimes I would have to erase them many times because those images wouldn't go away. And that was a special thing that we did. So if you erase it and then you go to take an x-ray and you see that there's still some residual, you probably have to keep erasing it several times. So when I'm using a CR or PSP system, I have to select the body part. Prior to or post exposure, I need to write on the cassette with a erasable marker so that I know what I x-rayed. So I'm gonna go in and I'm going to say that I'm x-raying this right hand and this is my lateral x-ray. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna process it and I'm gonna erase it. And then I'm gonna grab this cassette again after it's erased and I'm gonna say, okay, I'm gonna do a skull x-ray and this is my AP skull x-ray. And I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna process it and then I'm gonna erase it. Now, what would happen if I said that this is a right hand, this is my lateral view, but when I went to the computer, I typed in skull and I went ahead and I ran it as a skull x-ray. It's not gonna look right. The reason it's not gonna look right is a hand is a 100 speed system and a skull is a 400 speed system. So all I have to do is I have to go into the computer and say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. And I have to change that. I need to call that skull a hand. And that's very easy to do in post-processing. So if you select the wrong body part on um, the imaging system cannot recognize it. So the image recognition is accomplished through a computer algorithm. And if the improper part is selected, the image will be processed incorrectly, but you can fix that. You just have to know how to do that. I love these pictures here. Okay, when we were taking x-rays with film, we can see contrast. So up here, all these images were taken with film. So let's take a look at these images. So if I am x-raying a patient with film, I can manipulate my KVP, my MAS, and my distance, depending upon the film screen combination. So if I was x-raying a knee, um, and if I was using a grid, then 70 kvp 25 milliamps per second that's probably going to be a nice image okay and that looks pretty good right there where with film if i used 1.6 mas you can see that i i haven't even penetrated that knee it looks awful with film you can see contrast this right here is a high contrast image because it's black and white. Black and white is high contrast. Low contrast is gray, is long and low. Low contrast. You can see that with film. You can't see that with CR or PSP. It gets hidden. KVP and MAS, you got problems. So in a PSP system, radiographic technique is not critical because contrast does not change on your image. You can't see it, it's hidden. And that's the problem. We have a lot of people that are overexposing patients. So the conventional approach that KVP controls contrast in MAS and object density does not hold true for PSP systems. PSP imaging system contrast is constant regardless of radiographic exposure. Images can be made at higher KVP and lower MAS, resulting in additional reduction in patient dose. PSP systems should be exposed at similar techniques compared to film screen. So if I was taking an x-ray of a knee with a grid, and I knew that with film screen, I use 70 kVP at 25 MAS, then that's where I should go when I'm going to CR. 
if I used less MAS, I'm still going to see the picture, but it's not a true image. And that comes on the post-processing end. When the physician goes to post-process the image, it's not there. I mean, this is hard to talk about because you're overexposing the patient or you're underexposing the patient. You need to properly expose the patient. Now, I know people are going to say, well, if I can get away with 70 kVp and 2.5 MAS and it still looks the same, then why shouldn't I do that? Because you haven't captured what was there. It's kind of like when you're outside and, you know, there's lots of fog. You can't see through the fog. So if I was told to use 70 kVp at 25 MAS when I use film, if I go to CR or PSP, I need to use the same. Now it's going to be different with DR, different with DR. But with CR or PSP, what you use for film, you use for films, you use for CR or PSP. Okay, so then we come to our image and we do what's called post-processing. Now, here's the problem. You really shouldn't post-process. That's for the doctor. Now, what I might do is I might, you know, hit these buttons and say, oh, okay, he can do that. She can do that. But then what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to hit the reset and go back to original. I'll manipulate the contrast and the brightness just to see if the physician can do it. But then I go back to original or, this is my favorite with this AGFA system, I will go ahead and manipulate the heck out of this image and then save it as new. I will give them an original and I will give them a new image that I made pretty on my own. That's okay. But you really shouldn't change this original image because it's kind of like when I was taking x-rays on film screen. You shouldn't bother the image. You need to send the original. But if I were to manipulate brightness, it is the image's ability on the display monitor, and it is measured by a photometer. So I can go in and I can change all of these on my computer. I can also look at the contrast resolution, which is the ability of the digital system to display subtle changes in shades of gray. So on this particular computer, you know, they're all down here. I can go ahead and I can change these but then I would save it as new. Or you probably want to leave it alone. And I know this is an ugly picture, um, but this is just a picture that I saw on the monitor and I was able to um, find this picture for you so that you can see the controls that we have. Now there's something that's called contrast resolution. It's the ability of the digital imaging a digital system to display subtle changes in shades of gray. That's what I love about digital imaging. But sometimes digital imaging drives me crazy. Because let's say that I had somebody that came in and they had thick hair and I didn't move the hair out of the way. You could actually see a patient's hair on this image, especially if it was real thick because of contrast resolution. So you need to be very careful. Um, you cannot x-ray a patient with a sports bra because it shows up as a density. I know patients say, I'm only wearing a sports bra, it's okay. Well, my radiologists say, no, it's not. I don't wanna see a sports bra, that's a density. And no, don't do it. But contrast resolution allows us to see all the different shades of gray when we're looking at an image. Spatial resolution we talked about also, it's the ability to demonstrate detail. With digital, you can see fractures that you could not see with film. And it's also because we can go in and we can change our field of view to see these parts of the image. With CR or PSP, we also have noise. We did not have this on x-ray. Well, we did, but it is more, I think it's more common if you have an ugly image that will appear on CR or PSP. 
It's anything that interferes with the formation of an image. The principal source of noise on a radiographic image is scatter radiation. Now, when I worked in the operating room and if I was doing fluoroscopy, there's something that's called the um, bovi, and that's what they use to cut, um, like they were cutting into the skin. If they were using the bovi and it was plugged into the same plug as my x-ray machine, I would get noise on my image. My image would look like this. It's weird, isn't it? So we finally figured that out and we were like, oh, okay, so I guess we have to go ahead and we have to plug it into a different panel. Weird, but yeah, this is what noise looks like. This is noise, image A is noise, it's ugly. Um, it's anything that interferes with the formation of an image. Exposure latitude refers to the range of exposures in a diagnostic image the values the image detector can produce and is dependent upon the image detector. So this depends on if you are using film screen, if you are using CR or DR. Exposure latitude is wide and results in almost 100,000 shades of gray, each of which can be evaluated by post-processing. Now, I'm gonna get up on my soapbox and I'm gonna talk about exposure indices. Exposure indices drive me crazy. This is something that you have to know. And exposure indices is going to be different depending upon the system you're using. So at my hospital, we had AGFA. So I used an LGM number. Um, I've gone to places where that we have S numbers and EI numbers. So you have to know the difference between all of these. And the only way that you know what you have is by reading. So this one right here, this system is an LGM number. So I know that's an AGFA system. If I saw an S number, I would know it's Konica or Fuji. So what do I do? I take an X-ray and I look at it and I say, oh, that's pretty. Okay, now what? You know how I showed you all those knee X-rays? and they all look the same? Well, we have to now look at an LGM number or look at an S number or an EI number dependent upon the system. So I look at this picture and I say, okay, I think I did a pretty good job on this X-ray because the patient's lungs are on the film. Um, I have the bases on the film. I didn't cut off any pathology, I'm good. Okay, so positioning wise, I'm okay. But did I under or over penetrate it? How do I know? I have to look at something that's called an LGM number. LGM number is the logarithm of the median exposure value within a specific, specific area of interest. Each image is assigned a user selected class speed class setting. When the numerical value of the IGM changes by 0.301, which is the logarithm of two, this indicates a factor of two differences in the exposure to the receptor. Now, what does that mean? Well, we have an ideal range for an LGM number. So if I had a perfect X-ray, it would be 2.2. That's a perfect X-ray. I wanna be between 1.9 and 2.5. Boom, I'm 2.33. I'm good. I can go ahead and let this x-ray go. But if that number was wrong, then if I needed to re-expose my patient, then I can change the milliamps per second. So when I am looking at an LGM number, it's okay to change the MAS to get a nice exposure. So let's say that the radiographic technique on this was 80 kVp at 5 MAS. That's great, they've got it listed there. If I were to go from 5 MAS to 10 MAS, then the LGM will increase by 0.3. If I were to go from 5 all the way down to 2.5, 
then the LGM number will decrease by 0.3. Collimation will also affect your LGM number. So if I want a nice x-ray, I want to make sure I use the appropriate MAS. So if I was told when I was shooting film that 80 kbp at 5 MAS is what I shoot for a chest x-ray, then I know my LGM will be appropriate. Okay? So that's what we do. We manipulate our milliamps per second, not our kbp, our milliamps per second to change our LGM number to get it within the target. We're looking at getting within the target. Now that is LGM. And these are all called exposure indices. This is an S number. It's a sensitivity number. It corresponds to the sensitivity setting of the photomultiplier tube necessary to obtain a present density level. To evaluate the exposure of an image with an S number, you must evaluate the S number. The S number is inversely proportional to the exposure in MR reaching the imaging plate. Okay, now this one is backwards. So if my S number is high, then I have underexposed my patient. If my S number is too low, then I've overexposed my patient. This is backwards. And I don't like S numbers because they make me have to think backwards and it drives me crazy. So, and it's also body part specific. So if I'm x-raying the extremities, I'm looking for an S number that's gonna be between 75 and 200. Let's say that I took a hand x-ray and my S number was 300. My S number is too high, which means I've underexposed my patient. So it's backwards. That's why I don't like S numbers. It makes me think backwards. So remember that S numbers are backwards. If my extremity S number was 300, my S number is too high, I've underexposed my patient. If my S number was 50, my S number is too low, and I've overexposed my patient. I've used too much MAS. Weird, huh? That's why I don't like S numbers. S numbers make me think. Properly exposed images should fall within the guidelines. S values above 600 indicate the image was underexposed by 300%. An S value less than 100 indicates substantial overexposure. An S value below 50 is drastically overexposed that complete erasure of the latent image may not be possible. This could cause the net exposure done using this imaging plate to show a loss of contrast due to residual energy that is remaining. So S numbers are difficult. EI numbers. An EI number is an exposure index and it represents the average pixel value of the clinical region of interest. A change of 300 in the value of EI indicates a change of two in exposure to the receptor. The target EI value differs for general purposes and detail cassettes. So this is also going to be body part specific. So this is a pelvis x-ray. And for a pelvis x-ray, I want to have an EI number of 75 to 400. What is my EI number? It is 616. My EI number is too high. With this particular system, if my EI is too high, I have overexposed my patient and I need to decrease my MAS. So I'm fine with this system because this works the way that my brain works. But you've got to be careful when you're looking at these systems that you know what to look at when you're looking at these numbers. They're all going to be different depending upon the system. 
So that is the end of CR or PSP. We're now going to go to DR. So I'm done with computerized radiography. We're now going to go to digital radiography, which does have some pieces that are similar, but not all. DR. DR is digital radiography or direct readout. We don't have cassettes. We have flat panel detectors or FPDs. A detector that consists of a photoconductor, which holds a charge on its surface that can be read out by a thin film transistor. FPDs are divided into indirect capture and direct capture. And these are heavy. They're very heavy because all the computer parts are inside of there. So these are very heavy. That's why they have handles. And these are very expensive. They're probably about $1,000 a piece, probably more than that. I'm probably way off on my numbers. Um, the other thing is if you drop it, it can record a shock. And if you're logged in, it will say that you shocked it. So we can tell who dropped it because it records the shocks on some systems. Indirect capture digital radiography, absorb x-rays and converts them into light. The light is then collected by an area charged coupled device, complementary metal oxide semiconductor, or a thin film transistor, and then converted into an electrical signal that is sent to the computer for processing and viewing. This is indirect capture. Direct capture converts the incident X-ray energy into an electrical signal, typically using a photoconductor as the X-ray absorber, and sends the electric signal to a TFT and then to a ADC, which is a alternating, excuse me, a analog to digital converter. The ADC signal goes to the computer and processes for viewing. So for um, FPD, which is flat panel detector systems, the material used for detecting the X-ray image signal are permanently enclosed inside a rigid protective housing. For these systems, the detector is in the table, the wall stand, or portable. The image will appear in three to five seconds. Remember, it took about a minute and 20 seconds for um, CR or PSP. The active matrix flat panel imagers consist of a flat panel array with an X-ray absorption material. There are two types, photoconductors and scintillators. Now the one picture you're seeing with the toggle switch, that gets plugged into um, the computer. So these can be removed. But in saying that, if you drop them, you will mess up your images and you probably will have to buy another. Do not drop these. If you drop these, you mess them up really bad. Don't drop them. So photoconductors are materials that absorb x-rays resulting in electrical charge. Scintillators, photons that produce light when absorbing x-rays. So you have a flat panel that has a handle um, because it's very heavy. When an exposure is made, the sensing or storage component within the pixel contains the image information. The image is then read out line by line via the changing of the control line voltage so each pixel is connected to its corresponding data line at the bottom, bottom of a column. Once the signal has been released, the energy is then transferred to the electronics that are attached to the edge of the array. Now what about x-ray technique? Okay, so throw out what I told you before about CR. DR is different. With DR, KVP still influences subject contrast. Okay, so let me go back here. Let me go back, 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 back. So if I was going to shoot a foot x-ray, and if I was using film screen, I would want to be anywhere between 50 to 60 K to 69 KVP because I don't have a grid, okay? So if I'm x-raying an extremity, that's where I want to be. But maybe the people that, send, that sold me the machine said, 
use 55 kbp for all hand x-rays and i say gotcha and then i manipulate my mas i would say okay 55 kbp at 2 mas for hand x-ray that is then what i use for a cr system dr is different dr likes high kbp it likes high kbp but i would never use 125 kbp on a hand x-ray that's way too much so i need to stay within the parameters of kbp all right so you can use high kbp on a dr system because it works better, it feels better if you use higher KVP. So KVP still controls subject contrast, but you still can't see it with the CR and DR. You can't see it. KV still influences subject contrast, but radiographic contrast is primarily controlled by an imaging process called a lookup table. A lookup table or an LUT is a table that maps the image gray values into some visual output intensity on a monitor or printed film. So for digital processing, MAS has more influence on image noise, whereas density or brightness is controlled by algorithms with the lookup tables. So it's important to minimize scatter radiation. FFPs, which are flat panel detectors, are more sensitive to scatter than screen film. So you need to protect these um, from scatter radiation. FFP systems function very well at high KVP and low MAS. So you wanna use the 15% rule. What does that mean? Okay, so let's go to a KUB. Let's go to an abdomen X-ray. So if I have an abdomen X-ray and I'm using 80 KVP at 10 MAS for an abdomen, and I needed to go to digital, I would use the 15% rule. That means that I would increase my KVP by 15%. So 15% of 80 would be 12. So I would add 12 KVP. So I would go from 80 KVP to 92 KVP, and I would cut my MAS in half to five. So I haven't changed my radiation whatsoever because I used the 15% rule. The 15% rules means in order to maintain constant density, you increase the KVP by 15% and you cut the MAS in half. So if I am on CR or film screen, an X-ray that is taken at 80 KVP at 10 MAS should look the same on a DR system when it is at 92 KVP 5 MAS but DR likes higher KVP. So that's why you can use higher KVPs for DR. Image orientation. Okay, I don't know about you, but I'm short, I'm only 5'2". So if I was x-raying this patient on the table for a left knee x-ray, I have a really hard time getting to that patient's left knee. I would probably have to stand on a step stool. So, I would either turn my patient the opposite direction, but if I do that, then I'm changing the anode um, heel effect, or I would just grab a step stool. If a patient is placed on a table with their head in this position, then I should not have to flip my image. It should come out upright or correct. So this is how this image would come up if this patient is placed on the table in this manner. If I put my patient's head down at this end, then my x-ray is gonna look like this. It's gonna be upside down. So that's image orientation. FPD systems, without a cassette, the position of the part should correspond with the marked top and sides of the detector. And the software, you can just go ahead and change the orientation and do that in post-processing. It just takes a couple extra seconds. Spatial resolution we've talked about before, but resolution in space is a measure of how small an object one can see on an image. The spatial resolution of our eye is 200. Um, and here we're seeing um, images. 
So we're about, mm, this is 200 right here. So this is what we could see with our eye. Spatial frequency. Spatial frequency is described by the quantity of spatial frequency. Spatial resolution is described by the quantity of spatial frequency. It's expressed in line pairs per millimeter. So in digital imaging systems, we are limited by pixel size and no digital system can image an object smaller than one pixel. As the spatial frequency becomes larger, the objects become smaller. Higher spatial frequency indicates better spatial resolution. Contrast resolution. Contrast is either high, black and white, or low, more grays. The ability to distinguish many shades of gray from black to white, digital systems have better contrast resolution than film screen. The principal description for contrast resolution is grayscale. So if it's high contrast, it's black and white. If it's low, it's lots of grays. And you need to see that in an abdomen when you're looking for lots of grays. So there's our dynamic range. Back when we were using film, we wanted to have all of our film have a readout of 1.5. That way we knew it was a perfect film. So with film screen, object, uh, optical density was zero to three. The dynamic range is 1000, but the eye can only see 30 shades of gray. The grayscale can be made more visible with the use of radiographic technique to increase image latitude, but the eye can only see 30 shades of gray. Well, if we go to digital imaging, the dynamic range is identified by the pit capacity of each pixels. DR may have the dynamic range of 17-bit system which means it's 16,384 shades of gray. So you increase the dynamic range when you go to a DR system. Here's noise once again. It limits the contrast resolution and it can um, be altered by radiographic technique. So as MAS is increased, the signal to noise ratio is increased and patient dose is de decreased. Here's the problem we have with patients that are exposed to digital imaging systems. In digital Im imaging system, contrast does not change with dose. The image receptor cannot be over or under exposed. However, Poor radiographic technique can overexpose a patient. So, in saying that, you can choose to x ray an ankle and use 55 kbp at 2.5 milliamps per second. Or you can go in and you could select 55 kbp at 5 milliamps per second. You're not overexposing the image receptor. You're overexposing the patient. Because the image receptor says, I don't care what you're giving me. I know what I need, and I'm just going to go ahead and fix it. And it does. But you still overexpose the patient. So if you're told to use 55 kbp at 2.5 MAS, do it. If you use more than that, the x-ray is going to look the same. But you've overexposed the patient. The patient still receives the dose. It's kind of weird, but that's how it works. That's why I'm afraid of digital. Because digital, you can overexpose your patient all day long and you never see it. Just like CR, we need to look at the exposure indices. So I'm going to get on my soapbox now and talk about exposure indices. When we look at the digital displays, the digital displays give us lots and lots of information. Now, back in the day, if I put the wrong name on a patient 
and I was using film screen, I could go grab that film, take a little um, uh, sticker, and put the sticker over the patient's x-ray and fix it and put the right name on there. Well, here's the problem. If you do that to a digital image, once you hit send, everybody sees that image. So think about it this way. I'm putting the patient's name in there and I have a chest x-ray and my patient's name is Susie Jones. And the person next to me is using the same monitor as me. And I go ahead and I get my image up there and we both have names at the top of our screen and they pick the wrong name and they put that image with my name of my patient and they hit send. I can't retrieve that image. Well, I can retrieve it, but I don't know who's looked at it because these go out instantaneously. Let's just say that it went to the ICU and the patient had a pneumothorax and it was the wrong name. That's when you get on the phone and you call the ICU and you say, I am so sorry, but this is the wrong patient. Go stand in that patient's room and don't let anybody touch that patient until we get this fixed. It's a bad thing, but we have the ability to put names on patients. So when we put in demographics, we have to put the correct name, the correct identification, the correct date of birth, the correct exam. We sometimes have patients that have similar names and usually we will get an alert in the hospital saying, we've got two family members in the hospital, be, be very careful. But it's hard, you gotta be very careful with digital. So let's take a look at post-processing. Post-processing allows the operator to optimize the appearance of the image. You can go ahead and you can annotate, you can write on the image, you can write with pre-select terms or manual text, you can window and level any region of the 16,384 grayscales. It can be expanded into white to black grayscale that is helpful when soft tissue images are evaluated. You can magnify with the magnifying glass that is located on the computer screen to increase or decrease the image. You can orientate or flip the image. You can image invert, making it white to black or black to white. Now, I like to be careful here um, I like to use my right and left marker prior to x-raying my patient, um, but you can put a right or left marker on here if you forgot to do so when you went to take the image. Some systems will have something that is called image stitching. Image stitching, when anatomy is too large to fit on one cassette, multiple images can be stitched together with a software program, but this is a software that you need to purchase. Now, exposure indicators. Exposure indicators need to be very careful with exposure indicators. Exposure index is the amount of exposure received by the image receptor, not the patient. Knowing how exposure factors affects the exposure index is key to provide enough exposure to the receptor while limiting exposure to the patient. When you take an x-ray, you need to look at the number. It is a numerical representation of the amount of exposure, usually by the mean value. Now, I have a system in my hospital that is a DI system. DI is deviation index. The difference between the actual exposure and the targeted exposure expressed in a logarithmic fashion. The DI determines whether the image is under or overexposed. So the sweet spot for a DR system that uses a DI number is going to be zero. That is a perfectly exposed image, is zero. If you have an overexposed patient, you are going to have a positive DI number. So if you have a DI of one, that means you've overexposed your patient by 25%. If you have a negative number, you have underexposed the patient by 20%. Now in saying this, sometimes the physicians will say to you, just go ahead and take a look for making sure you're within the green. This is within the green because the DI number is 0 0.6. So that is fine, that is a good exposure. But when we look at this image on the bottom left, 
that one is overexposed four times the average dose. So that patient is in the red. When it's in the red or the yellow, you might wanna go ahead and re-expose the patient. But remember, when you re-expose them, you give them more dose. So <clears throat> if I took this chest X-ray and I saw that I clipped off some anatomy, then when I go to take the next exposure, I will change my MAS in order to try to get as close to zero as I can. So you can mathematically do so by changing your MAS when you are going from one exposure to the other. So what's the difference between the three? Well, film screen, we were able to take a couple pictures on the cassette. We walked that cassette into a dark room and we processed it. CR or PSP, we take a cassette that has a plate inside of it. We process that cassette. We can only take one image on that cassette. We put it into a reader and then we can manipulate the image. For the DR, it's instantaneous. Your, your picture comes up on your screen and you know immediately if you need to repeat the patient. Um, what I'll do is I'll tell the patient, you know, take it a big breath, blow it out, keep it out, breathe, don't move. The reason I say don't move is because I'm deciding, do I need to take another x-ray? If I need to take another x-ray, then I will go ahead and I will move them or make a manipulation change before they actually get off the table. Okay, so that's the difference between all the different modalities. Have a great day.